So you've just bought your first personal computer, you've brought it home from the store, you're unpacking it, and then comes the moment of truth. Which is the serial port and which is the parallel port? Are my slots ESA or ISA? Will my modem run off COM1 or COM2? Is my memory expanded or extended? And on and on. With the new low prices of PCs, there are millions of new personal computer owners who don't know very much about what goes on inside that box. If you've just bought your first personal computer, this show is for you. As we bring you a beginner's guide to personal computing on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by Intel, the world's leading manufacturer of microprocessors. Intel, the computer inside. Additional funding is provided by the Software Publishers Association, providers of educational materials to help manage software. Don't copy that floppy. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and with me today is Ron Kobler, editor and publisher of PC Novice Magazine, one of the few computer magazines that doesn't assume the reader knows a bit from a bite and so on. Ron, this is the basic computer you might buy in the store as you take it home. I want to begin by asking you to give us a guided tour of inside this little box over here and, and tell the viewers it's okay to take the screws out like I just did and lift the top off okay, uh, because you're going to have to do that eventually. Yes, the, uh, the computer case is the housing. It's the main box that comes with a computer okay. system. You use that at a pointer if you'd like. Uh, so what's in here? When you take the top off, probably the first thing you'll see is this large plastic laminated board. That's called the motherboard. Okay. On the motherboard, the main chip that you'll find is the CPU microprocessor, which is the brains of the computer. And that's a 486SX in yes, this case? Yes, in this particular unit. Uh, you'll also see on this motherboard this bank of dip switches, which is a uh, line of switches that can be changed when you add things to the computer. Uh -huh. There's also a battery here that goes with the system clock. Mm -hmm. um, you'll also find on every computer, you'll find some expansion slots, uh, which allow you to expand the capabilities of your computer and system. And add cards or boards. That's correct. All right, what else do we have? Um, we'll find in, on every computer there will be some sort of storage capacity. On this particular system, there are three drives. Uh -huh. There is a multimedia drive, a CD-ROM drive. There's also a diskette drive. That's a three and a half inch floppy drive. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And then underneath the CD-ROM drive on this unit is where they have stored the, the hard disk, right. the main storage area on the computer. What else is in there? Uh, every computer will have RAM memory on the system. In this particular system, we have slots where we can place up to four SIMs. Uh -huh. um, next to the, the memory on this system, you can see an empty socket where you can actually upgrade the microprocessor. Mm -hmm. And uh, in addition, in the front, you'll be able to see a speaker. Every, every computer system will have some sort of mm -hmm. sound capabilities. And in addition to all these parts, the one thing that every computer system will have is some sort of power supply right. to power all the different units. All right, we're going to get into greater detail about the insides of this box in just a minute. We will, in fact, try to answer the most common questions that new computer users have. How does DOS work? How do you get more memory? How do you use those expansion slots? What are all the connectors for on the back of the computer? How do I speed up my machine? How do I get better graphics and so on? Now, those first few weeks with a new computer can be challenging. Where do you turn for help? One option is a new telephone helpline called Rent-A-Nerd. Rent-A-Nerd may help you. If your printer won't print or your modem locks up when you're in Windows and there's no one around to bail you out, now there's a real live computer nerd you can rent for a buck a minute. Head nerd Mike Wyckoff says no problem is too small. We're a niche company, okay? About 5% of the people in this country work for Fortune 500 companies, and they can deal with larger vendors who have built-in support staff built into the cost of their product. Our niche is the 95% that doesn't deal with the high-end vendor like this, who buy things mail order, who buy things off the shelf, and don't have anywhere else to go for support. Rent-A-Nerd runs out of a small office in a suburb of Washington, D.C. Later this year, offices will open in Northern California, New York City, and Texas. They advertise in Computer Digest and the Washington Post, but most calls are by word-of-mouth referrals. 
Wyckoff answers a lot of the questions himself, but he's got a long list of experts he calls in on an as-needed basis. And if it's close by, he even makes house calls. How you doing? Pretty good. Good. Got some goodies for you here. Oh, good. Gilly Conklin works at home. She discovered rent -a nerd when she decided to computerize the accounting system for the nonprofit group she works for. I do some panic calling if I... Uh, I hit the wrong button one day and everything disappeared, so I had to call him in a panic. But uh, and it's great too. He's always been right there for us. Um, if he's out on a call, they buzz him and he gives me a call and he calms me right down and says, "Don't worry, you can recoup that." And so it, it works out great. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Jonelle Patterson. So you go out and buy a new game for your new computer, you try to install it, it asks you some questions. What kind of display do you have? How much RAM do you have? How much room do you have on your hard drive? What kind of CPU do you have? How do you get the answers to all of those questions? Here to help us are Ron Kobler again of PC Novice Magazine and Dan Gukin, author of the book PCs for Dummies, a great book if uh, you want to find out what's inside your machine and you think of yourself as a dummy. Also this is the PC Novice Magazine we were talking about, also very, very helpful. Dan, let's start out with this issue of memory. You know, you go home, you bought your computer, you think it has everything you needed, you put in the first game and it says, can't run, not enough memory. Give us a quick tutorial on RAM, the different kinds of memory and how you solve those problems. Okay, memory is where work gets done in the computer. The more memory you have, the more work you can get done. It's that simple. There's a lot of confusing terms, a lot of ways to label different memory. Ignore it. Get a lot of memory. I recommend four megabytes. Minimum of four megs. Minimum of four megs for anyone who has a PC. Upgrading it is very inexpensive. It's also quite easy to do if you want a chance to do it yourself. And I'd like to show memory okay, sure. inside this, um, this Tandy computer that was taken apart earlier. I'm going to just show. This is one megabyte of RAM inside this computer here. This is a SIM. So that machine came with one meg. This machine came okay. with one meg, but it also has three additional slots that are identical where we could plug in three additional one megabyte SIMs to bring it up to a total of four megabytes. Now I have the SIMs here. These are what the sims look like. There's, there's different types and different varieties here. Um, you I could go, go to my computer them, store and just buy a sim like that. Or pay the guy 15 bucks and they, they would do it for, for you. Right, exactly. But it's easy to install yourself, in fact. Isn't you it? can do it yourself. Um, just plug it in and it's ready to use. Now, the question you ask, what type of memory? Yes. There's extended, expanded, conventional. Who knows? Who cares? Why bother? Right. The answer to that problem is to get a memory management package such as Qualitas' 386 Max, which I have here. There's other packages, including uh, CRAM, uh, QEMM, uh, you know, a lot of them to do this job, because it's a big job, it's a confusing issue. That'll handle it for you. You've got a question in a manual that says you need X number of uh -huh. megabytes of expanded memory. You configure the memory management package to do that. You have your memory, no more worries. So buy that software, that'll help you solve the memory problem. Buy a memory management package, DOS 5 comes with it as well. Got it. Uh, you can bone up on that, you'll be fine. Ron, let's turn to the question of display. You go out and buy your computer. First of all, you're not sure what kind of display you should have. You hear all this alphabet soup stuff, then you find out there's a card involved with the monitor. Just go through the whole display business. Okay, well basically, in order to get something up on the screen, your monitor works with a video card and the CPU. Uh, you can't just mix and match monitors with any particular system. You have to make sure that the monitor is the same as the, the video card that you're using within your particular So computer. if you want to get a better display, you not only need a new monitor, you need a new graphics card. Uh, yes. What you want to do is try and get a graphics card that has a higher resolution. Uh, resolution uh, refers to the number of pixels that are on a screen. That's a picture element, little tiny dots that are on the screen. Right. The more dots you can pack in the screen, the higher the resolution. The so when you hear 640 by 480, you're talking about the horizontal vertical number of dots. That's correct. The first number refers to the number of dots horizontally. Yeah. The second refers to the number of columns. Right. In, in, in it. Uh, and screen. those boards over there, they're graphics cards that you might buy for your computer? Yes, this particular card, it's a VGA card. Um, the two main parts of a card are the graphics controller and the memory that comes on the So there's card separate itself. memory that's on the graphics that's card right, video itself. memory that comes on the card. Now what's the big board? This board, uh, in addition to the uh, graphics controller you can find on some cards, you can also get to accelerators, uh, boards that will actually speed, speed up, up the process the of getting the, uh, uh, something on the monitor. And this is one of those cards. Okay, now when you opened up that Tandy before, you showed me a slot that was for upgrading the processor, you said. And you have some processor and speed up chips here. What are these? Yes, so uh, we have some examples here of uh, coprocessors, which are chips that work in conjunction with the CPU, the main processor on the computer. 
Uh, they help speed up uh, math functions, for example. These are different examples of coprocessors coprocessors are along the bottom and then CPUs on the top. Okay, so that's overdrive, which you had mentioned before. I could stick that in and that would make my basic CPU run faster. Yes, depending on the system, you can just put in a chip and sometimes you have to flip a couple of dip switches to make uh -huh. it run faster, but uh, you can upgrade that way. And how about these cards over here? What are they? Uh, these particular cards uh, have uh, CPUs on the card and they work much the same way. And instead of just putting a CPU right on the board, the motherboard, you actually insert the card. Uh -huh. uh, the thing with CPUs that you need to remember that you'll also hear, this is with the alphabet soup with the monitors, you'll hear numbers in conjunction with CPUs, right. 286, 386, 486. Uh, the important thing to remember is the higher the number, the more powerful the processor. So uh, and it's also the more expensive and then it, it confuses is. everything, yes. right? <laughs> All right, let's go to mass storage now, Dan, if you will, and explain what, what's the hard drive and how big a hard drive should you get? I mean, we hear 40, 80, 120, 200, et cetera. Yeah. I recommend off the top, 200 megabytes. 200. 200 will get you Windows, all the Windows software, a lot more room to spare. You should always double whatever you think you'll use. Right. But speaking in terms of, of memory, hard drive is a type of memory. The computer RAM chips provide you with temporary memory where you get your work done. You want to save your work, you save it to a hard drive. Now this is that same Tandy computer. The hard drive is, is uh, clinging to the underside of the CD-ROM drive. Now in other computers there'll right. be different configurations. But this is what the hard drive looks like and it's connected by a cable to the motherboard and the hard drive controller. Just like the video monitor is connected to the controller. Um, shouldn't have any problems with your hard drive. You just save stuff there. Remember to save it there often. 200 megabytes, you'll have room to save stuff yeah. for a long what time. What about the speed of a hard drive? How important is that? A uh, fast hard drive will really make a, a big difference in a computer. If you can't afford a newer microprocessor, you can often buy a faster hard drive and it seems like you've yeah. gotten a, a better deal. Uh, the access time is how they measure the speed. Yeah. It's measured in milliseconds. The smaller so the number, quickly you can the get faster the data. you can access it. Like 12 milliseconds, very fast. Right. 20 milliseconds, not as fast. Right. 28 milliseconds or any number bigger than that, and eh, maybe you want to stay away from that because today's technology, that's kind of slow. In terms of quality, the hard drive is important. I mean, that's the mechanical thing that's inside your machine that's most likely to break down, isn't it? Well, actually, floppy drives will break down break, before a hard right. drive will. Hard drive's constantly spinning, which is why it's so fast. Uh, the floppy drives, there's a lot more movable mm -hmm. parts. Uh, things can go wrong in a floppy drive sooner. But uh, the point is, all this stuff, you should know about it but you don't really have to know. You don't really have to open your computer and point to this and yeah, that and yeah. know that this is a SIM and this is a memory chip. You should know what it is, what it does, what kind of role it plays in the work you do, uh, and just enough to talk about it intelligently. You don't need to have the degree in computer science. If you want to go okay. that far, great. Otherwise, know what kind of storage it is, yeah. know the video processor, the microprocessor. But anyhow, 200 megs minimum on your hard drive. 200 is what I recommend. One last question, Ron, to you. Uh, when you go and you look at the computers, you hear the 286, 36, 46, but then there's, there's the megahertz, you know, 16, 20, 25, 33, 60, et cetera. How important is that? Uh, it is important. The megahertz uh, refers to, it's a term that refers to millions of cycles per second, the actual speed of the microprocessor. All else being the same, the faster the megahertz, the faster the microprocessor. Again, that also correlates with the price of the microprocessor. More megahertz, uh, more expensive the, part the CPU is. Yeah. Uh, but it is important. It's, uh, it's very nice to have a very fast microprocessor. You'll appreciate the speed later on. So more and faster is the basic rule no matter what you're buying here, right? Gentlemen, thank you very much. One of the best ways to get answers to your computer questions is to dial up a user's forum on an online service like CompuServe or Prodigy. How do you do that? We'll show you right now. Click your mouse, pull down a menu, and get ready to access more information than you could possibly absorb in one sitting with one of the half a dozen or so online services available to computer users. Bob Bales of Carlisle, Pennsylvania chose CompuServe because it was easy to install and even easier to use. Of course, you have to have a modem, so uh, assuming that you purchased your machine with a modem, uh, the, the next thing uh, you, you do is just uh, go into the software package that CompuServe provides you with, select the, uh, the subject you want to go after, and, and, and hit the Enter key. It's, it's just very simple. CompuServe offers a wealth of forums organized by topic, where users have access to library files and a message section. This is where the value of online services really hits home. An awful lot of the value in CompuServe comes not from CompuServe itself, but from the other subscribers helping each other in uh, in dealing with whatever questions you pose or um, issues you're trying to get answers to. Let's say you're a WordPerfect user like Bob and you've got a few questions about compatible hardware and software. Let's select the uh, discussion about FEC software. 
So this is a, a gentleman uh, asking a question about how to uh, fax without exiting from WordPerfect. So the ability to uh, export a document that he's working on from within WordPerfect directly to a fax machine. And we can follow the, uh, the discussion. And here's a, a fairly quick response to his question. Uh, uh, another user in the forum. And the forums aren't just about computer use. There are forums for, uh, for hobbies like stamp collecting, coin collecting, fishing, hunting, uh, and uh, you can get in there and chat with people and find out where the, uh, where the bass are running. I mean, it's, uh, it's really pretty, uh, pretty neat. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Jonelle Patterson. When you bought your computer, you were only beginning your entry into the world of personal computing. Most PCs are expandable through ports and slots. What are they and what can you put in them? Here to answer those questions are Jim Lauterbach, director of PC Week Labs, also Jeff LeBlond, author of Friendly DOS from Bantam. And this is Jeff's book over here, a series of friendly books for people who are beginners, and of course PC Week magazine, which is the labs that Jim is associated with. Jim, let's take a look at this machine. This is a compact, which you've turned around backwards so we can look in the rear and show us what are the ports, what are the slots, what are the ways to talk to the outside world. Sure. Uh, right here, you'll see all the way on the right, is the keyboard port. Every computer has a keyboard. It plugs in right there. Right here, you see the mouse port. Uh, some mice plug in here. Some, uh, some computers don't have mouse ports. Right here, COM1 and COM2, these are the serial ports, communication ports, a parallel port right here, and finally a VGA port to plug into the monitor. Now, running along here are internal slots for add-in boards that you would plug in. This particular system has three, some have others. So the little hole in the back there is where you, you, your board would stick out. Right, yeah. and if your board needs to communicate with the outside world to a stereo, to another VGA, to anything, right. it would plug out here and you'd be able to plug it right in there. All right, Jeff, let me turn to you now. When you have slots, it depends on what kind of slot, what kind of bus standard you have, right? There are four different standards out there, and you've got to know which kind of card is going to fit into your machine. Run through that for us. Yeah, let's, let's talk about the four different standards that are available. Now, the first is the industry standard architecture, and it was introduced with the IBM uh, PCAT in 1984. Okay, and that's called the ISIS standard. The ISIS standard, right? and it's uh, still around, very popular. Now, uh, here is the microchannel architecture. This was introduced by IBM mm -hmm. in 1987, and it was really a way to expand the data highway so that you could move more data across the expansion right, bus. So 32 bit versus 16 that's, bit for the ISA board. That's correct, okay. yes. And now here is the ESA board, the extended industry standard architecture board, and it's also a 32 bit bus. And um, it was introduced by the clone manufacturers uh -huh. as a response to microchannel. Now here is the most recent standard to date, and this is the Visa standard, also called local bus. Now um, if you compare this local bus board to this ISA bus board, you'll notice that there's a great deal of similarity in the teeth, yeah. particularly at this one end of the board. Now on the other hand though, if you look at this end, you'll see that there are uh, teeth where the board plugs directly into the motherboard. Mm -hmm. And the advantage is there is that you can bypass the expansion slot altogether and go directly to the CPU. The advantage is you can uh, get higher resolution graphics at a much greater speed, bypassing the slower expansion bus. Right. All right, now what about, Jim mentioned the serial port, the parallel port, what do you do with those? Okay, now the serial port, uh, often called the RS-232 yeah. port, you may hear that, also the COM port, those are used primarily to connect uh, mice mm -hmm. if your system does not have a, a mouse port. And here we'll, uh, we'll just uh, show you where you can connect it in here. So that that's would a, go into a, a COM port right, or that's a serial a, port. That's yeah. correct, yes. Now another popular use for uh, a, a serial port is, to, is a modem, an external modem. Here we can connect into COM2 uh -huh. in this case. Now you may find when you get your external modem, that it has a slightly different connector than, than those you see here. This is a nine pin connector. If that's the case, what you need to do is get an adapter, also sometimes called a pigtail, uh -huh. and this has a 25 pin connector, which will make up the difference. The point is that they're really identical, a nine pin and a right. 25 Okay, pin. now what about the parallel port? What do you do with that? A parallel port actually operates at a higher speed than uh, serial ports, and they're used for printers mm -hmm. and scanners and... Right. Uh, 
All right, That's Jim, let's turn to you again and talk about the different things you can shove in here. You talked about the slots and so on. Now, Jeff has explained the different kinds of slots. You've got a pile of cards and <laughs> boards there. What are the goodies I can add to my machine? Well, you can add things not only to the slots, but to the parallel port as well. Okay. And I brought, first of all, some parallel port items. This is a sound card that you can plug into a par parallel port, and you can either use it in a desktop computer or on the road. So you can get sound and not have to tie up a slot. Exactly, okay. exactly. Now here, you were talking about CD-ROM earlier. Yeah. This is a CD-ROM drive that plugs into the parallel port. Again, uh -huh. You don't need an interface card at all. Just plug it in and go. Uh -huh. And this particular one works with both Macintoshes and with PCs. Now, when you're using the parallel port, do you lose your printer then? Yes, you do, in many cases. Some devices give you a pass-through so that it will, you can print as well. Right. I don't happen to have one with me, but okay. you can do that. Now, beyond that, standard cards. Slots, yeah. Let's say you need another parallel port or a serial port. This card gives you both another parallel port and a serial port. Some will give you even more. Okay, so you tie up a slot, but you get more ports. Right, exactly. Okay. A soundboard. This is an example of a soundboard here. Uh, this is a uh, sound card that also offers some other things. It's got a CD-ROM interface mm -hmm. as well. It's, a 60, it's an 8-bit card, and it has a game port here, and that lets you connect your joystick, or in this case, it's a game pad right. that's almost like a Nintendo. So you get the joystick, and you get music on your games and sound effects. Exactly. And so on. But not all soundboards have a joystick port. This board has the CD-ROM interface, uh -huh. but here it's also got a VGA port. So this is a, this is a VGA card. It's actually a VGA expansion card. Uh -huh. So it'll do uh, Super VGA and 1024 and by 768, it. and it's got yeah. a soundboard as well. Okay. So you got to be careful when you buy a soundboard to make sure you're getting the right mix of of uh, components. Now beyond just sound and VGA, this is a full motion video card from uh -huh. Intel. What it does is it lets you take input from your VCR, input from your television, input from from your uh, video mm -hmm. camera, digitize it, put it on your computer, and then play around with it, and then output it to your VCR, output uh -huh. it to your right, TV, right. or output it to Windows. So this is, this okay. is a, a very high-end card, real video, it's very interesting. Okay. And then finally, for those of you who are connecting your PCs into a uh, network, uh -huh. this is a network card, it's an right. Ethernet card, it plugs right in. Okay, what about other peripherals, Jeff? You, once you buy the computer, you need other things you can plug in there. I mean, printers, scanners, you name it. What's the most likely peripheral you should think about buying next after you've bought your PC? Well, a uh, printer is, is undoubtedly the first one to look at, and generally the printers will hook up to the uh, parallel uh -huh. port. Another important device, uh, uh, becoming more important all the time, is the CD-ROM. Here, this uh, CD-ROM hooks to a parallel port, but you can also get uh, CD-ROMs that uh, hook into a, a SCSI port as well. So that's another consideration. And why is the CD-ROM worth buying? Well, the number of titles that are coming out are uh, fantastic right now. Uh, you'll also find that uh, there are many developers now that are working with CD-ROMs, mm -hmm. and if they're using them, uh, yeah. one can expect very soon that the rest of us will start to be uh, Okay. Using. Jeb, Jim, thank you very much. Thank you. That is our Beginner's Guide to Computing. Stay tuned now for this week's Computer News on Random Access. In the random access file this week, it's a Windows world. The Software Publishers Association says for the first time in history, Windows software is now outselling DOS software. Total software sales for the first quarter of 1993 were nearly one and a half billion dollars. That's up 20 percent from last year. This was PC Expo week in New York, and we have lots of new product announcements. The Technology Group announced the introduction of Xyrite for Windows, featuring the usual Windows capabilities plus full command line control. Quorum announced a deal with Microsoft to port Word and Excel with Unix workstations. Both programs will be sold on one CD under the product name Quorum Equal 1.0. Samsung has entered the direct mail PC business with its new line of 486 desktops and laptops. Samsung says it will ship within 24 hours and offer one year on site service. And Bureau Development has introduced Twain's World, a new CD ROM collection of the complete works of Mark Twain, including rare video clips shot by Thomas Edison. Time now for this week's software review from Paul Schindler of Windows Magazine, provided courtesy of CMP Publications. Today, we're going to look at the best of the high-end databases for Windows, Paradox from Borland. Now, how do I know it's the best? Because I tested Access, Superbase, Fox Pro, and Paradox for Windows Magazine. They're all good, but Paradox is the best. Paradox is fast, well-documented, and colorful. 
It isn't the fastest, Fox Pro was, but it offers a more Windows-like interface. For example, there's the icon bar. If you're confused about what the icon does, roll your cursor over it and the definition appears on the bottom line of the screen. One of the toughest things to do in a high-end database is quickly create an input screen. Access creates screens that are more colorful with its wizards, but Paradox does them faster. Plus, you can see what your screen will look like as you click your way through radio buttons, selecting column or row display, single record or tabular display. Right mouse click on any item on the screen and a menu pops up that enables you to modify that item. Paradox for Windows is $800 from Borland International in Scotts Valley, California. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. Apple says Newton is still on track for a late summer release. The handheld digital assistant is expected to sell for about $1,000. Computer retailer CompuAd has filed for bankruptcy. It recently closed all 110 retail stores and is concentrating on its mail order business. And finally, a computer cookbook that is actually a cookbook with recipes for items like config sauce, lettuce one, two, three, and curd perfect. It's called Quick Bites, a computer lover's cookbook by Diane Pfeiffer. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. I'm Janelle Stelson. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by Intel, the world's leading manufacturer of microprocessors. Intel, the computer inside. Additional funding is provided by the Software Publishers Association, providers of educational materials to help manage software. Don't copy that floppy. Video cassette copies of this program are available. Computer Chronicles also publishes a companion newsletter containing details on products demonstrated plus background information on program topics. To order a video cassette or a subscription to the newsletter, call 1-800-366-9484 or write Computer Chronicles. Please specify program subject for tapes. All orders include a free software program for auditing software use and information on the definitive guide to keeping your organization's software legal.